Hi everyone, welcome to our virtual book club. My name is Karen Tresadi and I'm a program manager at the Women's Executive Network. We are very pleased and honored to have Leslie Ann here with us today. And I'm also very pleased to introduce her. Leslie Ann Scorgi's passion for personal finance was strong well before her appearance on the Oprah Winfrey Show in 2001. What started all the fuss in the first place was when she took up teaching her high school business class about investing, much to her teacher's surprise. Since appearing on the show in 2001 called Ordinary People, Extraordinary Wealth, Leslie Ann had branched out as a best-selling author, entrepreneur, renowned professional speaker, educator, and popular columnist with a star and television personality with CBC and Breakfast Television. Today, she is armed with her three bestsellers, Modern Couples Money Guide, Seven Smart Steps to Building Wealth Together, Well Healed, The Smarts Girl's Guide to Getting Rich, and Rich by 30, A Young Adult's Guide to Financial. Leslie Ann is the founder of MeVest, a financial education company. She has her BCom from University of Alberta and an MBA from Queen's University. In 2011, Leslie Ann's won Avenue's Top 40 Under 40 Award and WXN Top 100 Most Powerful Woman in Canada. I'm pleased to announce that we have a draw today. All you have to do is say hello in the chat box for a chance to win. We have three lucky winners. So the prices are two of Leslie Ann's books, The Modern Couple Money Guide, Seven Smart Steps to Building Wealth Together, and Well Healed, The Smart Girls Guides to Getting Rich. So both books will be signed. And the third prize is a seat at one of her amazing program, Money Boss. So good luck, everyone. And now I'd like to pass it on to Leslie Ann. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are joining from. It is an absolute pleasure and a delight to spend some time with you this afternoon. So like Karen said, uh, we've got some fun prizes uh, to give away. So we are giving away two, uh, two books. They're going to be signed. All you need to do is put your name in the chat box. Say hello to me. And also, I just don't want to feel so alone. So I'd like to see who's there. Um, so please do say hello to me. And then the other thing is we're going to give away a seat in the Money Boss program, which is the original uh, program that myself and my team created um, when we launched our, our money school. So that's exciting, too. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining me. This afternoon, I wanted to focus in on what is happening for women and their money. And I understand that it is a book club. And so I will reference a few pieces of material from the books, the two books, The Modern Couple's Money Guide and Well Healed, while I'm doing this presentation. But Given what is going on in for women and with the pandemic, it does feel appropriate that we do spend some time together on what is most pressing for you uh, when it comes to your finances. So my, my top piece of advice is um, let's use that chat box. Let's see what we can do to kind of rise up together and help each other out because there are so many great questions that I know that you have when it comes to your finances. So I'd love to be able to offer some support during this session together. So, um, and, and I'm, loving to, I'm loving seeing some familiar faces uh, also as, as you're loading up into the webinar room. So I wanted to talk first about what has changed since 2014, 15, and 16. In 2014, my book, Well Healed, came out, and it's the smart girl's guide to getting rich. And then in 2015, near to the end of 2015, the Modern Couples Money Guide uh, was launched shortly. So kind of like on the heels of Well Healed, no pun intended, but kind of funny. Um, so some things have changed and other things have not changed when it comes to women and their money. But let me focus first on what has changed since 2014, because I think that some of these changes are pretty monumental and not all of them are super for women. Some of them are actually quite concerning and we'll need to pay attention to them. Some of them are also quite good. So let's focus first on what has changed since 2014. Um, we are right in the thick of the pandemic, and if you've been paying attention to what is 
in the news right now and you're, you're paying attention to women's issues, you, you know that women have been sideswiped by the pandemic in a much more severe way than men. And Black and marginalized women have really taken the brunt in terms of their finances when it comes to the pandemic. So we have seen the pandemic's economic effect on women be much more severe than on men. And that is now coming through in data that we started to see late in the summertime. And in around, I'm going to say near to the end of August, you started to see some pretty powerful and not so great reports on the economic status of women um, in Canada related to the pandemic. So here's what's going on, is we during the pandemic and through this data have seen that there were far more women in um, what we call like precarious working roles or the gig economy than men. We also have seen women take the brunt of child rearing, homeschooling, and it's affected their career. But I think even more importantly, it's actually now, as of this week, increased the burnout rate of women closer to 65%. So we now have 65% of women saying, I'm hitting this threshold of, um, of burnout that I've never seen before. We've also never seen numbers like that before. Now, where this translates into money matters, and like Jennifer, you're saying it, like I'm experiencing that right now, right? You're feeling that right now. You've got a, you've got little guy who you're trying to, you know, prop on one hip and do your do your work on the other hip. And so, what we're now seeing is, unfortunately. 60 to 70% of women are now saying, they're raising their hand and they're saying, once this is all through, once I'm vaccinated, uh, things have got to change. Like I need to either move employers, I need to get myself into a better financial situation, I need a break. And that is cause, it's wreaking havoc on women and their money. The other thing that's happened is women were more likely to lose their job, jobs. And I call out black and marginalized women uh, specifically here. They were much more likely to lose their jobs amidst the pandemic than, than white women. And so we are seeing a very, very disturbing trend of growing unemployment, job loss, uh, reduced hours, reduced salaries amongst marginalized communities and particularly women. So when we now look at the most recent data on RRSP season, for those who don't know RRSP season, it kind of wraps up around the 1st of March every single year. There's a real push by the, the finance community, including myself, for, for all people who are over the age of 18, who are um, you know, generally making a fairly steady income. There's a real push to, to amplify your retirement savings during the last, uh, the, the last part of the year in the first few months of the new year. So during that push for, for RRSPs, um, what we now know, and again, we're just in April here, but we have the data, it's rolling in. We now can see that there were far few women, far fewer women this year that contributed to RRSPs than ever before. So what we have here is some factors that are actually impacting the long-term um, prosperity of women and the ability for women to succeed financially. So I'm going to layer one more thing on that the pandemic has wreaked havoc on women and it has to do with divorce. You know what? I wrote the book, Modern Couples Money Guide. And guess what? We are now seeing a 40% increase in inquiries for separation and divorce proceedings. We won't actually know all the data and the numbers for a little while longer to see if that actually transpires. But if you're feeling like, oh my God, God, I need a reset here. I identify with some or all of these issues. Right here in the chat, you can give me a little hashtag, I get it, Leslie Ann, or whatever you want. 
Um, I think that as we're talking today about some of these big issues, you know them, you see them, you are feeling them, you're seeing them with your peers, you're seeing them with your fam your friends and your family. Now it's not all doom and gloom because also during the pandemic, we saw women really take an interest in money management like we've never seen before. And that's something that I want to highlight and celebrate. We saw women start to rise up and say, this is super serious. I need to get on top of my money. We also saw women when able, when able, so they were continuing to work and did not experience reduced income, we saw that group of women start to save, start to teach their children, and start to be a more active um, and engaged voice in personal finance across media outlets, across educational institutions, and across the board. So it is not all doom and gloom. We saw women start to rise up during the pandemic. We also saw what we've always known is a great resourcefulness amongst women when it comes to their resiliency to get through tough times, including the pandemic and the finances associated with, the financial implications associated with the pandemic. So this is, really cool to see. It's so neat from my perspective to see women take an interest in money management. And also we know that they're reaching out and helping other women rise up. So that warms my heart and it makes me just so proud to be a woman who is <laughs> right in the middle of this pandemic with you, um, talking to you from my home office. <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and just excited about what is on the other side, because there's hopefulness, there is so much more that we have to give ourselves and our communities as women. So, um, you know, there are some things that haven't changed since I wrote Well Healed. Remember, Well Healed was written in 2014. So what hasn't changed, and this is fundamentally unlikely to change in our lifetimes, is women actually are pretty good when it comes to money management. So we know statistically that when women are given the opportunity to improve their financial skills and the skills of their family, friends, etc., they do fairly well with things like budgeting and wealth management. In fact, the data shows that when women embrace uh, the financial planning process, they learn to invest, they get proper advice, their portfolios tend to outperform their male counterparts. So this is kind of cool. And that actually hasn't changed in the midst of the pandemic or even in the past 20, 30 years. Women rock at money management when we have the opportunity to actually dig in and learn these skills. There's a few other things that haven't changed and they're kind of like Leslie Ann calling you to action, to take some action for yourself, for the benefit of your own finances here. And um, here's, here's what it is. Women still need to save more than their male counterparts in order to have a successful and comfortable retirement. And that might not seem fair to you, it certainly doesn't seem fair to me, but let me tell you the factors are at play that are at play here. So what we know is that because women are living longer, so they actually have longer life expectancies than men, um, and it's getting longer, by the way, with these incredible medical advances that we're seeing happen all the time. Uh, it's like every week, um, not only are we fighting COVID, but we are learning to prolong um, the, and, and like build people's health for longer periods of time. So, so women are actually living longer than their male counterparts. To the tune, it could be five or six years longer when we're starting to see the life expectancy data. In the future, that could for you mean that you're burning through many hundreds of thousands of extra dollars than your male counterpart would who 
would pass earlier than you. So that's something that hasn't changed. In fact, we're living longer. So we need to think about, um, you know, what does it mean to save more and that that's a real reality for women. There's another thing at play. And you know what? It's it's not something that I, um, you know, I think it's just something that that is like the pandemic is still uh, exacerbating this issue. Um, and I won't focus too heavily here today because it, it just upsets me. <laughs> but we are still dealing with the gender pay gap. It is real. Um, I've experienced it myself. I know you have too. Um, you're welcome to use the chat and say, yep, yeah, that's happened to me. So the gender pay gap continues to, to perforate our workplaces, large, medium, and small organization and Harpreet saying like, yep, I have exact, I have experienced that too. Um, I actually, in my book, While well Healed, recount a very distinctive moment in my early career where, um, where I, by accident, received the, the comp letter for my male colleague and um, the comp, and by the way, we had the exact same job. We had graduated from the University of Alberta at the exact same time with the exact same degree and the exact same performance metrics. And guess how much he was making? He was making $9,000 more than me for the exact same job. Now, this is, this is like um, material that <laughs> you can see. My pulse is elevating. I don't like talking about this subject, but we have to start talking about it more because I'm pissed off about it. I know you're pissed off about it. And it's 2021. We've just come through you know, the pandemic, which is exacerbating the issue around women's saving. We saw fewer women make RRSP contributions. We saw more of them have to exit the workforce due to childcare, due to um, it, it not, like not actually being able to, to do the work from home thing and manage all the homeschool and whatnot. And now you layer that with uh, pay equity issues. And I have to just call this out again, um, pay equity issues are much worse for black and marginalized women. And this is all wrong. This is what is holding women back from actually achieving financial parity with their male counterparts. So if you're wondering if this is a feminist finance rant, it's just a slice, I promise. We'll get on to the good stuff in just a moment. But we have to talk about these issues. We have to, and, and Lauren, you're calling that women with disabilities are also experiences, experiencing these, these gaps in, um, in their ability to earn. And <laughs> Elena, thank you. I'm glad you like my rant. I appreciate that. Um, and, and honestly, when we look at what is it going to take for women to, to actually recover from the pandemic, we need to look upwards together and we need to design a new story, standing up for ourselves, but also standing up for women who are suffering more than we are. And that is our role. That is part of what our change and our movement needs to do. So when I look at the timing of my book, <laughs> when I look at where we are today, I, you know, I got another book idea for you. <laughs> I think we need one on resetting, resetting cultural norms around women and money, resetting ourselves as women in how we manage our money, resetting our own money mindset views, and resetting the approach that we're taking toward building our own financial security and wealth. So let me share another insight that I think is pretty cool. And um, it's that during the pandemic, Martin, like largely led by women, frugality became cool. It finally became totally normal for you to trim your budget, for you to actually look at what you have in your, your household, whether you're single income earner, double income household, and say, no. I'm going to prioritize what's most important for me and my family. And, you know, I, I have for years been talking about, um, I've, you know, kind of made fun of my own self, 
about frugality and um, how frugal I am. And uh, you know what? I was just so floored at how frugality finally became kind of the norm during the pandemic. And my goodness, hasn't it taught us, and I can see this in the chat, hasn't it taught us how little we need to actually be happy, to be healthy, to educate ourselves and to move along. So, um, you know, <laughs> when I was thinking about this, um, I, there's a section in, um, in my book, Well Healed, I thought I would just read a tiny snippet for you uh, because I feel like it was like um, in 2014, I was kind of like beating, beating on the table saying like, Frugality is finally going to be cool, um, but, but here's the excerpt from the book I'm going to read for you, um, and it, I think it still rings true today, which is being broke is frustrating, embarrassing, and it's definitely not, uh, it doesn't make us feel good. It also limits our options. So imagine what you could do, and this still stands true today, imagine what you could do if instead of owing $20,000, you had $20,000. You could go back to school. You could save for retirement. There's so much more that you could do. And, you know, I think I'll, I'll skip forward here. Um, when it comes to your options for your finances, you know, if you're busting your budget every month, you have a few options. You can borrow more money, increase your income, or reduce your spending which is frugality. And, you know, I think what's really cool about this excerpt is that um, we know borrowing money is not good for us. And it also only deals with the symptoms rather than the root cause of any financial problem. Um, and increasing income, we all know, because we just talked about the whole pay equity issue, um, it's going to take time to fix some of these systemic issues that are in our society. Um, but really, your, one of your strongest options, if you're feeling the pinch right now, is actually reducing your spending and learning to live frugally. And, um, you know, there's some frugal fundamentals I share in the book that I think are a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and uh, if you care to pick it up, you can read those frugal fundamentals. But the reason I'm calling out frugality here is that women have really led the frugal movement over the past 14, 15 months. And it's totally cool to, to, to be that way. The other thing that we saw women really lead on was household budgeting and what we're calling for those who were able to continue to work and not experience major gaps in income, they are becoming what we're, the finance community is calling the community of super saver women. So we are seeing a niche in the, the market right now where women have taken the frugality to like a whole other level. And this should all now come back around. Remember I said how women have during the pandemic really proved their capability to save? Well, guess what? The data now shows that they are sitting on quite a bit of money in their savings accounts. So that would be applicable for women who continue to work fairly consistently and not have the, the drawbacks in, in their income. So um, I hope that this is, you know, and I think Amanda's saying the same thing, like 100%, I've never saved more in my lifetime. And it's because like, where else? What, what would you be spending money on right now? There's not a lot. It's not like you're taking fancy trips. What is going to happen, and this is, um, this is the part where I'm going to take you into a bit of a futuristic view now, is what we're expecting, though, is when the, uh, when the vac vaccinations are more widely spread and when it is safe to do so, we are going to see a surge in spending. And that surge could come as early as 2022. And when it dies, I want to just offer you a tip. It's take a measured approach. Like with most things in life, blowing the doors off is, is probably going to go backwards on you and, and not um, going to give you the, the, uh, like the long-term good planning that you're going to need. So be aware that um, 
there'll be a ton of pressure once most people are vaccinated to really blow the doors off. And I want you to take some stock in all of the accomplishments, the financial accomplishments that you have made in the past 15 months, because just imagine that you were able to catch up with your retirement savings over the past 15 months. Imagine you were able to actually make sure that your kid had enough money to go to, to university. Just imagine that you were able to actually finally, finally crush your consumer debt. There's one more futuristic trend I want to share with you before I dive in even further to some helpful tips for today. Um, the, the futuristic trend that we're all monitoring in the finance community at the present moment is we've seen consumer spending come down and we are a little worried that when the doors get blown off of spending, that we will have a flood of consumer debt. So near to the end of 2022, the worry is that consumer debt will be part of the financial story for many, many, many women. And I can tell you, I've been in this business for 15 years. Um, there is nothing more stifling than consumer debt, high credit card balances, high home equity lines of credit that can't be paid off um, to, to really stifle the progress of women creating wealth and financial security for them. So I leave these with you to, to just chew on, to think about, because imagine if you took the opportunity, all this incredible learning, this momentum you've had in, um, in the past 18 months, and imagine you channeled it it into um, actually making some fabulous financial choices for your future. So hopefully that is helpful for you as we look at trends from back in 2014. We look at what we've just learned in the past 15 months a la pandemic and when we look at some of the futuristic trends. So I got some questions from you already. And these questions um, were, they, they had some tonality that I've decided to pull out. And I'm going to share with you um, some, some tips on how wealth is actually created for women. And also, I am going to share three really expensive mistakes that statistically we see women making, um, you know, over and over again, and I don't want you to do this. So I want to just focus on um, the the process, the system um, that wealth that that women can use to build wealth. This is the part. If you if you don't have a notepad, um, you know, grab a pen, grab a notepad. Uh, I take a few notes. This is also, by the way, um, the system that we teach through all the programs um, that we run in my business. So my business is mevast.ca. All we do is financial education. We're not associated with any banks or institutions. We just give you the straight goods on what is happening, uh, what, are the, what is happening with money, what are the best practices with money, um, how do you build a plan. We have all of that in, in mevast.ca. So wealth is created in actually four steps. And uh, this is like, it's actually a little bit more simple than maybe um, you've heard loud voices in the market mentioned before. The first step is creating financial security. And financial security is, um, it's a combination of a few things. It's having savings and investments for the future, managing debt to ultimately a zero balance, and forming some really fabulous habits for yourself. So creating financial security in, um, in this process of, of building wealth is the step, I would say, most women want to, to skip over because it's really quite boring learning to budget, <laughs> dealing with debt. It's not the sexy part of the process, but it's also the foundation of all wealth. So why women don't progress up the, um, up the funnel of wealth is because the foundation setting here on um, the creation of financial security didn't happen. Almost that's, we can link it back almost every time to that. That's the first step, creating financial security. The second step is accelerating your income. 
we've already talked about this. <laughs> so accelerating your income is so critical. And would you note that women who are self-made millionaires actually focus on accelerating their income by about 6% every year, not just to keep up with inflation. They're doing it to to make up for the gender pay gap, to make up for their longer life expectancy. And they're doing it through multiple sources of income. They're not just focusing on one job. They have their investments paying dividends. They may have their hands in a few other income streams. Accelerating your income is a very sexy part of the wealth building process, which is why you see so many very loud voices in the market telling women, you need to focus right here, um, right? I know you've seen this. <laughs> you can tell me in the chat. Um, and, and you see it in your Instagram and Facebook feeds all the time. Accelerating your income is very, very important. And it's much easier done when you have the creation of financial security as that foundation in place. The third part of how you build wealth is called scaling your investments. Scaling your investments is actual focus on making your investments achieve the benchmark rate of return and keeping your fees low. So the scaling up of investments does mean you and I as ladies, we got to do more on this front. It's not, and here's, here's a zinger for you. You've heard, and you can tell me in the chat here, have you heard the rule that women need to save 10% of everything they make? Have you heard that? You can nod, you can tell me in the chat. Well, guess what? Guess what? When we now look at post-pandemic aftermath, if you wanna call it that, ladies, you gotta save 20. It's not 10 anymore. The bar rose and it's because of gender pay gap issues. It's because of pandemic. It's because of the longer life expectancy. Is this fair? No, it's not fair. I don't like it either, but it actually, the data is telling us we now got, we got to shift gears, which is why when you look at income acceleration, the previous step, if you are, if you are underemployed right now, if you are um, out of work, we've got to get you, we got to rise you, <laughs> we got to rise up because <laughs> we need to save more for retirement. So the fourth part of wealth, the wealth creation system is the most important part. This is the part, unfortunately, I see many women decide not to, to take action on this part and it is have a financial plan. The fourth part of the system is have a financial plan. And I am telling you, women statistically who take the time to build a financial plan with a professional have three times more money in retirement. That is what the data says. So if you are one of those gals who is DIYing it because you just don't like your advisor or the advisor was passed down to you via your parents, um, it's time to change. It's time to change that. Your best friend is going to be your financial plan when it comes to hitting goals. So let me recap. What I just laid out for you is called the cash system. C, create financial security. A, accelerate your income. S, scale your investments. H, have a plan. The cash system is the system that I teach all of my ladies in any of my programs because it works. You can, within any financial plan, and I think Lauren, you asked this, um, you know, you can include windfalls, you can include your spouses, um, their, their net worth in there. The whole core though, is that the details of your plan are actually embedded in a legitimate financial plan. So the cash system is going to be your best friend. We also know that the cash system is how women move up the wealth funnel. And if it's been a mystery for you for years, I want to demystify it today. It does not need to be more complex than this. It is a layered approach. One step builds off the other. And if you are one of those gals who is like moving quickly to try to, to do the other parts of the cash system without the C, the creation of financial security, please don't. 
it, it will backfire on you. You need to focus there first, iron out those fundamentals and then move up the wealth funnel. So this is so key. When we look at, um, you know, who helps support the cash system? I got a couple of questions on that um, right here, right now in the chat, but also um, they got emailed in to me. Um, and, and the questions were around, uh, Leslie Ann, like how, who, who do women need to go to to get the wealth funnel started? How do we start this process? Who is safe? Like who's who in the financial zoo? Because there's a lot of loud voices out there, it, and aren't they? And there's like 80% of them are men. Not all of them are bad. Like they're, they're great, right? Some of them, some of them are not so good. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, and thank you, Indira. <laughs> I'm glad you found that super simplistic. <laughs> That's all my, my learning from you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about who's who in the zoo. Let, let's start first with the fact that we statistically see women try to DIY their finances because they do not trust the financial community. But I just laid out the, the crystal clear rationale for why you will not want to do that. The Rationale again is that the DIYers end up with three times less money than those who actually seek professional guidance, get the training that they actually need to move up the wealth funnel. So that's the case. So if you are one of those gals who's a DIYer, I was one of them, by the way. I was one of them when I started. We all start that way. But as you progress, progress and you move up and you elevate and you rise up, you need to get support. So let me tell you who's who in the financial zoo. You can go to a bank and you can walk in the door and they can sell you mutual funds. It is unlikely unless you have fairly significant assets that you're going to get um, paired up with a financial planner who can help you with most of these parts of the cash system. But you can walk into the bank and you can get started there. That's actually how I started. I walked into the bank <laughs> and I started to invest. You can work with what we call a robo-advisor. These are, these are digital investment um, advisors that they're like, they're kind of like robots <laughs> and they allow you to invest your money, but they are not gonna teach you the C, the A, or the S of the cash system. You can work with a money coach or a wealth coach. That's like what we do. We have money coaches and wealth coaches and um, they're gonna work you through the full cash system over a period of time. Just remember um, when you walk into a bank or you walk in uh, or you like hire a planner to just crank out a plan for you, um, it's like kind of like a one and done event. But we know that working on your money is actually a multi-year event. When we look at, um, when we actually look at how women um, get the most out of the cash system, out of the proprietary, um, sorry, out of, out of the way that they move up the wealth funnel, we know that they're actually working on their money for about 36 months in total. Like they're doing work. They are learning this stuff. They're working with advisors. They're working with money coaches and or um, maybe they're working with, uh, maybe they're doing courses. So um, then you have the option to work with a financial planner. I mentioned that a financial planner is going to be able to kind of sell you products. By the way, they are associated with products, um, but they're, they're going to help you with that plan. And then you can work with brokers. These are, um, these are people who would sell you stocks, bonds, and they would create an investment portfolio. Remember, those folks are not going to do the budgeting stuff, the debt stuff with you, the education and empowerment piece. They're just there to sell you investments. And then the other thing that you can do is you can pair up or sync up with a very well-known financial educator. I'm one of them, but there's like plenty. We, there, there's lots in Canada. You can sync up with a financial educator who's got courses, who's got coaching, and who can give you the support that you're going to need over that period of time. Who's who in the financial zoo? There's many other voices. Let's be super clear here. The moment you get off this, <laughs> this call um, in your feed, uh, because this is how it all works on social media, in your feed, there's going to be a bunch of advertisements that start to show up for wealth planning, budgeting, et cetera, in your feed, banking, blah, blah. There are a lot of loud voices in the market 
about money and not all of them are qualified. You do need to pay attention to who you invite to help you with your finances. You do want to ensure that they are able and qualified to give you uh, advice and that they're, they're reputable. So what I wanted to now do, and let's see if, um, let's see if I can share my slides and you'll have to excuse me. Um, I am <laughs> a little slow on the draw here. Uh, okay, if you could just like tell me in the chat when you can see, uh, see my slides, that would be awesome. Okay. Still nothing, hey? Let's see. Oh, you know, I might be in for a fail here. I'm really trying to share my slides and not having much luck. Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna share my slides because Leslie Ann's having technical difficulties, but I am gonna tell you just verbally what I was gonna share. What I was gonna share on my slides was Oh, and thanks, Sandira. There is something at the bottom. It's, um, this was happening to me yesterday too. Okay. Let me, I'm, I'm not even going to bother. Okay. I'm going to tell you the three most common mistakes that I see women make with their money that I, I would love before I share these with you. <laughs> I would love your commitment to, to not make these mistakes. And I don't want this to sound like a sales pitch. It's going to sound like a sales pitch, but like legitimately, I, I want you to want this for yourself. It's not for me. It's for you. The mistakes I'm going to share with you are the most costly financial mistakes I see women make. And um, they are 100% avoidable. The way that you're going to avoid them is you're going to do things that are different from the average. The fact that you're even showing up here is different from the average. So when it comes to, to who makes progress on their money, it's women who have what we call a growth mindset. So they have the will, the desire, and they they actually feel worthy of this. They feel like they are worthy of a better financial story. They have a growth mindset and they pair that with a financial plan. So if you're wondering like, who is it that is getting ahead? It is women with that growth mindset backed by a financial plan. And now I will share with you that like, it's a personal story. Um, you know, like when I was growing up, I started with a very negative mindset and it was a mindset that was completely rooted in fear. And the reason it was rooted in fear is because when I was growing up, my parents had nothing. My dad was a paramedic, uh, until I was about seven years old. And unfortunately, his partner committed suicide. When his partner committed suicide, my dad went into a PTSD and health issues that were like literally debilitating. He was out of work for years. My mom went from being a stay-at-home mom, like somehow surviving off of, <laughs> off of my dad's income um, with a family of five. And my mom went from stay-at-home mom to selling Avon at night and doing legal secretary work during the day for a whopping pre-tax income of $2,000 a month. So from the age of seven until the age of about 14, 15, all I saw in my home was financial struggle. We were the family that often went to the food bank. We were not the family that could give to the food bank which is why the food banks today are so near and dear to my heart. But if you're wondering where my fear, financial fear came from, it was fear that I would end up in the same position as my parents. Absolutely broke, fighting about money all the time, watching my dad deal with mental health issues, 
and not being able to rise up. My mom learned how to budget. She somehow learned how to, how to stretch that doll, those dollars as far as they could go. But the thing about money is it's, it's never quite what it seems. Fear was the initial motivator to get me to start saving. When $100 arrived for me on my 10th birthday, I bought a savings bond. On advice from my mother, who was very much like, do as I say, not as I do, I bought a savings bond because I was terrified that that money would just go poof into the air and it would disappear. And after that, I became so motivated, so fixated on, on saving money. I had side hustles literally at 10 years old, which is wild. And I think what is like, you know, to, it's, it's kind of scary for me to admit is like, I was like babysitting people's kids at 10 and you really shouldn't be babysitting people's kids at 10. But, um, you know, the side hustle was what allowed me to start to elevate and to get out of the, it, it motivated me to actually start to save. So here's the interesting thing is when I was 14 years old, my fear made me extremely <laughs> um, fiery, if you will, about money matters. And I, I went around telling everybody um, that, you know, I wasn't going to be like my parents. I literally told everybody who would listen, I wasn't going to be like my parents. Um, I was going to, I was going to make a million dollars before the time I was 25. And I literally told everybody who would listen to me. And I was angry. I was angry out there, like pounding the pavement, telling everybody like, I'm going to be a millionaire before I'm 25. Watch me get out of my way. I can learn this stuff. And I was so angry. And, um, and I was doing it, right? I was saving money. I was side hustling. I got a job um, <laughs> at the library. I got a job at, the, at a local restaurant. I just started like stockpiling money. And, um, and I, I even told my teachers in my school, like, I'm going to have a million dollars by the time I'm 25. So uh, the, the local newspaper caught wind of my, my goal if you will, my goal to be a millionaire by 25. And uh, they published a story uh, across North America, actually it hit the news wire, went across North America entitled Wiz Kid. And it was all about how this young girl had me, had amassed like quite a bit of savings in a very short period of time. And look where she came from, like nothing, she had nothing. Um, and that was picked up by the producers of the Oprah Winfrey show which is the reason why I was on the Oprah Winfrey show at the age of 17 in 2001, telling everybody there, 2 million people live on that day, telling everybody there that I was going to have a million dollars before the time I was 25. And even, I remember even being in that audience and being like, I hate to say it, but it was like, I was so fearful. I was so fearful about money. I was so fearful and angry about my upbringing and angry. Um, and, but I remember just plowing through and being like, I am going to make my goal. Out of that Oprah experience, you know the drill. The Oprah effect is real. I got my book contract. I started saving like crazy. Like business was good. My investments were really blooming. And um, it's funny, in my early 20s, I actually developed a spending problem because I was so flush with cash, because I was so full of financial fear, because I wanted to make up for lost time. And I couldn't admit the real drivers of my mindset were totally and completely fear-based and super negative. So guess what happened? When I turned 25, I did not hit my goal and I was embarrassed. I was devastated and like, okay, imagine you tell five people you have a goal and you and you fail and then they come back to you and they you try and hold you accountable and whatnot. So like, imagine you have like a thousand people on your 25th year calling you to follow up because of this story that got ran years before about you being a millionaire by the time you're, you're 25. It was devastating. It was so devastating. 
And I would say that that moment was when I actually first tasted what depression really looks like and what financial fear really looks like. And that is the moment that was actually the pivotal turning point for me that allowed me to do the work with a therapist, do the work with a proper coach, start doing the work with people who knew how to build wealth and to actually move myself up out of depression and start to form a new and healthy, healthy balance between my goal. Didn't help that the 2008 financial crisis hit the same year, really bad. <laughs> Three years later, when I was 28, I hit my goal of having a million bucks. And, um, but I did it with a mindset that was like healthy. I did it with joy and I did it knowing that what was on the other side was totally worth it. And during the period of time from 25 to 28, I healed myself with support of other people. And that healing journey is something we're going to talk about next. When we look at mistakes that women make, it actually starts with mindset. It starts with what is chasing you right now? Where have you been? And are you ready to finally forgive yourself for mistakes you've made in the past? Are you ready to finally design a new story for your future? Because I can kind of help you with the mindset. I can share with you, um, you know, I can share with you some of the mistakes that you should avoid, but until you're ready to do the work, like <laughs> it's not gonna work for you. Um, it's not gonna work for anybody. So when you think about your journey and when I think of even my own journey and the decision that I made between 25 and 28 to, to achieve balance, to still hit my goal, but to forgive myself for some of my past, even though, by the way, I wasn't responsible for it. Uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> you can talk to my therapist about that. Um, but like the, the, the reason I'm sharing that part of the story with you is that everything to do with money actually starts with mindset. So if you haven't done the work today, I welcome you to start doing a little bit of work on some mindset. I welcome you to forgive yourself and to start learning how to elevate and rise up and move along because it's time to move along. It's time to design a new and better journey for yourself. So, you know, for me, the, the reason I was able to achieve my first million and continue to grow my wealth today, it is about shedding that negative mindset and then choosing that I am worthy of that financial security. I'm worthy of something better and, um, and, and building a plan. That's what's gonna make a big difference for you. So um, mindset does come from our life experiences and I want all of you, including myself, just be kind to yourself, right? You cannot um, blame your past for the mindset that you have today, but what you can do is design the mindset that you want for the future. That part is in your control, that you can decide today. And you can decide to take your past and for today, you know, move it off to the side and out of the way because it does need to get out of the way in order for us to, to create this path going forward. So when it comes to wealth, though, when it comes to, to women rising up and doing great things with their money, um, it is always going to go to women who do the work, to women who build the plan to women who decide that they're ready to roll up their sleeves. Like I said, I can help you with some mindset. We've already done some of that work today. I can share with you a few tips. We're gonna do more of that in a second, but I can't do the work for you. So if you want change for your finances, you, you need to know that there is a road ahead and, um, and you're gonna need to roll up your sleeves, but you can do it. So let's learn about some mistakes. Let's learn about the three massive mistakes that I see women make that I don't want you to make. This is again, the part where I would encourage you to grab your pen and paper, just jot them down and please do interact with me. Okay, so mistake number one is this, obsessively focusing on debt before starting to invest. If this is you in the chat, please type, 
Hashtag guilty. Mistake number one, obsessively focusing on debt before starting to invest. So it looks like this. You're on this hamster wheel. You're trying to get out of debt and you feel guilty all the time because um, you that has that stigma around it. And so you're thinking the harder you work, like the sooner you'll be debt free, but it never seems to go that way. In fact, uh, it kind of gets bigger and doesn't get smaller. And as soon as you're all paid off with your debt, that's when you're thinking, I will start to save for retirement. That's kind of what this mistake looks like. And I see women make it time and again, because we are predisposed to being conservative. Taking care of debt is a very conservative action. The reason you are thinking this <laughs> is because um, you were told likely from parents, grandparents, teachers, friends, and neighbors, that the only way to build wealth is actually through debt freedom. And um, there's such a strong stigma behind that, that you, you just want it gone. So the only time that we really take a super close look at it is when it is too late. And we see this time and again with women. The challenge with this is, is simply that, um, the method that you're using for death, debt reduction is probably costing you thousands of dollars. It's not structured efficiently. So you have to do two things with debt. You have to permanently change the reasons you got into it for the, in the first place. And that means healing your relationship with debt. And then you have to associate with yourself with a system of debt reduction that's actually going to work. Um, and that requires training. It is not a DIY approach. This is you learning to do this um, and not trying to do this all yourself. So when you decide that you're ready to do things different um, and you're ready to let it go, I just, you know, I want you to stop thinking about debt as like the only way to financial freedom because uh, it's debt, debt reduction being the only way to financial freedom. That's not the case. Um, you know, you, you actually in your financial plan will see a well-designed financial plan will have you starting to invest your money for the long term whilst you're taking care of your debt at the same time. So it's going to happen simultaneously. And um, that is the way that women break free is they start designing this profitable plan for themselves that's going to lead them to debt reduction while they're starting to invest so that they don't lose this super precious thing called time. So if that is you and you're making this first mistake, I want you today to decide that you're done with it. It's time to do something different. So when you're doing, when you decide to do it, things different and you do learn a system, you decide, I don't know, maybe you work with a money coach, maybe you take a course on debt reduction, um, you will have more time and more money, a better mindset, and you'll actually know how to use the, the right kinds of debt in the right kinds of way, ways. So are you ready for mistake number two? This is very costly. <laughs> mistake number two is this, you have money left over in your budget at the end of the month. If that is you, hashtag guilty again. <laughs> if you have money left over in your budget, that is mistake number two. And uh, you might be like, what are you talking about, Leslie Ann? Um, it looks like this. The harder you work uh, at being like a meticulous budgeter, having more money left over, um, you think that you're getting ahead and that you also might think that mastering budgeting is like a one-way ticket to wealth. So the reason that you're thinking this is that you've been, actually, you've been taught that, that budgeting is really the answer to financial independence. Most of us actually were taught that. That's where our, if you've learned anything about money, it was around budgeting. Um, and, and that is, is not the whole view of how wealth gets built. So if you continue to leave money on the table and have money left over in your budget, you're actually going to burn yourself out. You're going to not learn how to budget like a millionaire and uh, you'll have much less debt. Uh, sorry, you'll have much less money and probably more debt than, um, than your, your peers. So the, the worst outcome here is that when you're running your budget like this, uh, you're not going to be prepared for retirement. So it's time to let this one go. We don't want money left over in your budget. Um, instead, we want you to kind of strengthen that money mindset, increase your cash flow, and just be better with your finances. So if you really want to budget like a millionaire, like a millionaire woman, you're going to put every single dollar to work. And if that means you had leftover money, you're putting that toward a task. 
Um, and then you're finding the joy in saving and never having money left over. So that's how the millionaire approach to budgeting is. It's always assigning dollars to jobs. So there, there's not willy nilly money left over in outer space um, because that disappears. Mistake number three is this, assuming a brighter financial future is just gonna happen for you. And if that's you, hashtag guilty again. <laughs> um, it looks like this. So you may have uh, financial goals and uh, maybe you have some investments and, uh, or maybe you have no, no investments at, you're, at all. And, or maybe you work with somebody at the bank. And the reason you're making this mistake, um, thinking that money is just gonna happen for you is that it's probably that you might be scared that the financial plan that you're about to create is going to cost way too much money or that you're scared of the fees associated with it or maybe you don't know where to start or maybe you don't trust the advisors in your life um, or, or you may have seen like way too many advertisements on TV uh, for DIY investing. So um, I want you to, to know this and we've talked about it that uh, before, but if you don't have a proper plan in place for your retirement, it could actually cost you your retirement dream. And um, I don't want that for you. Like I want you to have the flexibility and freedom to choose what you want for your life. So in statistical terms, we know that those without a plan, those who are like, oh, it's just gonna happen to me. This is just gonna fall into place. Those women actually go with they lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential savings for retirement. So um, yeah, magical thinking doesn't work. <laughs> um, so if ladies, those are the three mistakes um, that I don't want you to make. I want you to be really savvy with this. And um, you know, if you want to, to make changes and to shift your mindset and you want to have uh, the ability to avoid these mistakes, you got to get a plan and it's got to be based on a profitable framework. So here's a couple of tidbits for you when it comes to financial planning and when it comes to, um, when it comes to you choosing who to work with, uh, whether it's a course with me, it is a CFP that you hire, whether it's a wealth manager that you hire, doesn't matter who you, who you hire, by the way, it really doesn't matter. Um, what you need to know is that a proper financial plan can be built, the framework for it can be built in about 90 days. So it's actually fairly quick, but learning the ropes of how to fill the plan, how to nurture and grow your plan, that takes more time, right? That could take up to a year or two. And you see, based on the evidence I mentioned before, you actually see women investing a couple of years of energy to, to really learn how to how this planning process uh, works. And when you do, your money's gonna start working for you. So here's the scoop. When we look at the statistics, um, when we look at the statistics around like what women are spending on planning and education in their in for finances, it's about three percent of their their income for thirty six months. Not necessarily consecutive in a row um, months, but we know that that is what is leaving their wallets in order to become financially uh, successful. And so uh, you, when you do this, should start to see the results. So whether it's mentorship, coaching, training, planning, um, the results are that women who decide to do this are going to make, well, statistically, they have made about three times more money in their retirement plans. So they are really retirement ready. The way that I like to think of it is this, and then we're going to switch to Q&A in a moment. Um, the way I like to think about it is this, uh, your your investment in your financial future is possibly the most guaranteed, most lucrative that you will ever make. We look at what's happened to women amidst the pandemic, and I don't want that for you, right? I want you to, to elevate, to rise up, to get through some of these blocks and some of the stuff that has happened during the pandemic and get out the other side much, much stronger. So, um, you know, I think you're going to rise up if you start treating the, the knowledge that you have, your financial knowledge, as like an investment in yourself. And I think with that, that's going to cause the shift in not only your mindset, but also your willingness to, to 
work on elevating yourself through that wealth funnel. So um, that's kind of like, I think it for, for me, uh, for like the formal part. Now I'm going to take some questions um, and, and hopefully I, I've got a couple off to the side. Virginia, I think you're, you're, uh, you're coordinating them in the chat, right? Okay, super. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, give me a second. I'm going to pop open the chat box. Yeah. Um, I lost my internet <laughs> during this. Okay. <laughs> so I lost the above chat. Um, it like wiped it out on my chat. So okay. okay. Yeah, Let me. Interesting. So that's if anyone has any questions, please do dro drop them in again. I apologize because it wiped it out of my chat. Yeah, no problem. Um, um, so the, Lauren was asking about uh, financial relief um, for COVID and how it's any comments on, you know, it in regards to women. Yeah, I think, you know, we're seeing with federal budget this week, we're seeing uh, COVID relief be extended. Is it, uh, <laughs> is it enough? No. It is not enough to resuscitate um, small businesses, especially women-owned small businesses. Um, and so all I can say here is, uh, Lauren, uh, you and I, we have to raise our voices. We have to ask for more specific support for, for women entrepreneurs. Um, the extension for a lot of the, the federal um, uh, aid is is now until September and until the economy like until more more businesses are back on their feet it's possible we could even have another extension on that so um Elena has a question on borrowing to invest so Elena the 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 way we ch we do leveraged investing is if you have room in your tax advantaged accounts specifically your RRSP and you also can, uh, uh, you're not at your limit <laughs> for what you can contribute um, then, and you can afford the loan because you're gonna take out a loan to do this. It tends to be uh, an accelerator tactic we use as, as women grow wealth. We do recommend it um, a lot of the time, not all of the time. It would have to do with your history on debt. And Elena, if you have never spoken with a money coach or a financial planner um, or taken like a, like a comprehensive wealth course, you absolutely should make sure that you're consulting before, before you actually do the dive in because leveraged investing is always higher risk investing than straight up cash investing. So Harpreet's got an... Um, uh, okay, so <laughs> Harpreet's got a question. How can we contact you uh, for further guidance? So Harpreet, um, so Virginia's putting in here, there's a few ways that you can uh, get in touch with me. The first way is you can send me an email. Info at mevest.ca is how you can get a hold of me. Myself and Shannon from my team are always on that inbox. So we would, uh, we'll be in touch with you shortly. The second thing Virginia just posted in here is we have our secret art of building wealth uh, class that we are, we actually extended enrollment until Wednesday for this group. So if you are interested in actually learning how wealth gets built as a woman, this is a women-focused course. We only have women in this program. Um, and you can take our free masterclass to see if it's the right fit for you. www.mevestmoney.com slash registration. That's how you are going to be able to get in uh, to the masterclass and see what we're doing in the secret art of building wealth. So that is another um, area, Harpreet, if you're interested. Uh, okay, so um, uh, Nav Navneet is asking for a financial planner, a $1,500 fee for a plan plus 1% uh, of investments. Is that reasonable? So Navneet, 100% uh, it is. Uh, and this is the thing. I, I want to explain something to you about the financial planning uh, process. So if you want to go out and commission a plan uh, with a planner, easily you're in it for $1,500, okay? They will, um, they will build you a plan and then they will usually sell you the investments to go inside that plan. That is very standard. It depends, Navneet, on what you need though, because if you need a plan, but you also need empowerment and education and kind of like the backing to help support that plan, 
you are looking at a two-pronged process. You might actually need to work um, more comprehensively, uh, like do check out the secret art of building wealth, our course, because that's where you're going to get the empowerment and education or work with a money coach first to understand that full empowerment and education around, um, around debt management, around how this plan is actually going to work. So it depends on where you are on your education journey. Um, but that fee that you're seeing here on the screen, $1,500 plus 1% 1 of um, assets under management is absolutely standard, absolutely standard. So depends on how you want to, how you want to spend money. Uh, this planning costs money. Courses around wealth management, they cost money. Um, our courses are priced at the exact same price point and you get a financial plan and you get the education behind it. So like we're all in, we're all going to come in at about the exact same price point. Um, Darcy's got a great question. So what are your thoughts on purchasing a rental investment uh, property versus putting that money into low fee indices? So Darcy, here's a, here's actually a question back for you is, do you have a financial plan? And here's why I'm asking. I see a lot of women try and cut over to real estate investing before they actually have topped up their tax advantage retirement accounts. And that's a mistake almost all the time. So like 98% of the time, if that is you, um, and I don't, I don't have your books in front of me, I can't actually see. Um, but what I can tell you is if you don't have a comprehensive financial plan, where you're looking at taxes and you're looking at all of the options to, to invest your money in a tax advantage way. Um, absolutely. You should not be investing in real estate until you've done that work. Um, real estate investing is something that is near and dear to my heart. I've been doing it since I was 21 years old. Um, but it was all, it's always been in the context of, um, how do we reduce the amount of taxes? How do we make sure that there's uh, wealth being generated? And all, all the time, it's about cash flow positive real estate. Um, so Darcy, I hope that's helpful for you. And um, you know, if you have further questions, please do reach out and, and we can chat further. Amanda's got a question. Well, we just discussed putting aside 20% personally for savings, but what is your opinion on a percentage to be putting away for business, um, for either a nest egg or to invest in as a company. Uh, okay, so Amanda, I think here that you are a business owner, if I'm reading between the lines here. Um, okay, as a business owner. So, um, uh, gosh, okay, so Amanda, you should absolutely be working with your planner and your accountant on this. Uh, as a standard cash flow uh, allocation is 20% uh, of all business revenues being put off to the side but it depends on your tax situation and it depends on how profitable the business are, businesses are. I don't know the condition of your books um, and I don't know if you've got losses or carry forwards. Um, so it is going to be um, pretty key that you're working really closely with your advisor on, on that. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're also not a mind reader. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I was, Amanda, but um like absolutely, typically it's like a minimum of 20%, but it can totally flex for you depending on the condition of, of your books. Um, okay, so let me just pop over uh, from the chat to some of the questions I got emailed because uh, I want to make sure I get to those. Um, this one's great. So I've got young kids and I'd like to make sure that they're, uh, these, these young girls are uh, financially independent. Um, and so like, what do I do with my, with my girls? And so the number one thing I can suggest is you got to start talking with them about money uh, as early as possible and, uh, you know, buy them some resources, uh, get them, get them a copy of Well Healed. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, start talking to them about finances, but also don't be afraid to hire them a money coach as a Christmas gift or a birthday gift to have them sit down, make a, make a budget and uh, keep it light and fun. The best way to teach a young lady about money is to start talking about it. We all need to actually start talking about it <laughs> uh, so that we can just have, you know, a greater, more full conversation about what's happening with our finances. So don't shy away start talking about them, get, get them an allowance, make them manage that allowance, um, make them learn how to budget. That would be, those would be kind of some of my top tips. Um, okay, and another one that came out uh, via email 
is should I buy a house once I have enough money or wait <laughs> until I have kids, etc. like more needs based buying? Um, I can tell you that answer might be served to you uh, without you having much choice. Right now we have an overheated housing market and it's, it's actually quite concerning how hot this market is depending on where you live. In, um, in North America and Canada in particular, it's like perforated into large and small communities. So um, when you're buying a home, I would say you should absolutely ask yourself if you need the home um, and what is that purpose of that home? Like, is it to, to live in or is it an investment? Um, what, is the, what is the underlying purpose? There's a myth out there that renters are poor and that is not correct. Um, there's a great book out there called The Wealthy Renter. Pick it up, um, read that book. It really lays out the case for renting and that you can still be wealthy whilst renting. Um, so it is like, I think it's like the, the craziest time ever to be buying a home. And uh, I feel for anybody that is just trying to break in. Uh, I would say do what you can to save as much as you can and don't buy by the skin of your teeth. That's a bad idea. You'll want to have a nice, robust, like, amount of savings uh, before you go in. I'm going to go back up the chat because there, um, there was some questions about um, working with a financial planner. Okay, so Heather had a question, and it was, um, I'm thinking about working with a financial planner who offers a lot of support. And she does sell her products. They all do. They all sell products um, if they're licensed financial planners. Um, so would you advise spending money uh, to work with a fee-only advisor? Um, that can be quite expensive too, uh, to determine if you're on the right track and whether um, you're spending too much on fees, etc. Uh, so Heather, I will say, um, depending on your, where you're at with your journey, uh, with your with how you feel empowered and where your education is at. Um, I absolutely recommend a combination of the two. I think you should be spending money um, on some money coaching or some course-based learning to help you set that foundation on things like budgeting, to know what to look for, to understand how to interview financial planners. Like there's a, there's a method. We have like a, we have a, a very robust method that we use to, to help you interview um, multiple financial advisors. So you should be interviewing um, planners, uh, but you should also be doing some, some fee-based only work at the same time. And the reason, I don't want you to overspend here, but um, the reason is you, you almost, like planners will always sell you proprietary products and that's like, that's their job. My husband's a planner. Um, so I know that I know this world really well, um, but it's really important that you also have some independent advice that's going to come in for you uh, and that that will be extremely helpful. So, um, okay, so let's have a look here. I'm going to go up the chat because I know, Virginia, you lost some some of the chat there. Yeah, I, um, someone was, I, I've got Darby on the side here helping me with this too. Um, so she said that someone was um, saying, you know, that we can't necessarily um, depend on inheritance anymore, like mm -hmm. we used to. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, on like, yes. Yeah, so the way we do planning is if the inheritance is basically guaranteed and you will receive it in five years, we include it in the plan. If it is not guaranteed and or more than five years out, we keep it out of the plan. That's kind of the general rule that we follow. And, uh, you know, there's always flex <laughs> with all of those standards. So my advice is that inheritance is uh, kept out of your plan unless you have a written agreement that says on this date, I'm getting this amount of money. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's definitely bank, bank, baked in there, baked in there. <laughs> Pardon me. And then she commented, do you find that women are less likely to receive inheritance versus men? No. Um, in fact, it's going the opposite way. We have more wealth transfer via inheritance going to women than, than men at the moment. 
And um, there's like many factors at play there. I, we won't have time to get into that, but uh, we are seeing a lot more wealth get transferred to women, which is why we're seeing more women taking interest in money management, but also they find themselves standing still a lot of the time, not entirely sure what to do with the money. So if that is you and you um, have no idea, like what, what is my next step with this inheritance? It's your perfect opportunity to, um, to reach out to, to a money coach or a planner and um, start discussing like what's the long-term game plan uh, with that money. So a lot of wealth is being transferred at the moment. Okay. Um, and then how much debt is advisable to be carrying during COVID? Um, you know, the least, the least that is that least is best. So we're actually finding consumer debt levels are coming down, um, which is which is a good thing. But we, like I was telegraphing earlier, expect them to go back up unless like prudent decision making now is uh, is in place. So when we look at your one's household income, the budget best practice is that your about 10% or so of your budget is going toward debt payments. So if you have more money than 10% of your take home income going to toward debt payments, I would say you're probably dealing with the higher end of, of debt and that that would be a little bit of a concern. So um, if that is you, that's what you're struggling with, um, you may really benefit from, from doing a bit of work on your debt. And um, like we have, a, we have like a miniature course that we offer called Debt Crusher. And uh, you're welcome to take a gander at that, but it is gonna be a combination of paying it down, but also likely a restructure of the debt. So you wanna make sure that 10% of your take home is going toward that. But if it's like, and if it's 12%, it's fine too. Um, it's just gotta come out of other categories. So it's all about shifting. Um, we are getting close to the end and I know some people have that they need to be somewhere by 2.30. Are, are you comfortable doing our draws? Now? I am. I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I did have to replace one name because someone left and it's a live draw, but, uh, I see that. I see it on my text message. Okay. <laughs> okay so, um, the winner of the well Heal book is Marlene Carrington. So Marlene, if you wouldn't mind sending us an email to hello at mavest.ca, we will make sure that you get um, a copy of Well Healed. And um, okay, the winner of Modern Couples Money Guide is Daria Kowal Kowalik. I think I said that right. Daria Kowalik. So hello at mevest.ca. Uh, Daria, if you can email us, we'll get your address to get this mailed out to you. Congratulations. And then the winner of the Money, Money Boss course, which is um, it's our basic course that we have, uh, that is going to... Uh, that is going to Navneet Goman. So Navneet, congratulations. Um, you are getting a seat in our Money Boss program. So uh, with huge gratitude, I just want to thank you um, and congratulations to our winners. Uh, thanks for showing up and deciding that this is important to you. If you are interested in taking our master class where we actually go deeper into the cash system, you'll learn how, how we teach and like you can learn more about the secret art of building wealth, please do go to Mevest mevestmoney.com slash registration and we have it's a free master class you can go through the class check it on out um, and feel free to send over any questions so hello at mevest.ca thanks everyone and congratulations to our winners thank you so much for spending time with us today leslie ann um, I do have some slides I'm going to go over with everyone for uh, WXN, so feel free to stick around. And again, um, I dropped a couple times in the in the chat there um, the uh, the masterclass that's coming up. Um, that's open until Wednesday for registration, and I will also include it in an email with the recording um, by the end of this week. So thank you again, Lysanne. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Um, 
this is the second time that we've had you in the last, I think, six months, and we love getting your financial advice. It's so, so good. Thank you for having me. What a, what a fun afternoon. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to some slides. Um, so the two books that uh, we talked about today were Well Healed and The Modern Couple's uh, money guide and Leslie Ann actually has more than uh, just these two books so please do visit her website at um, evest.ca slash books and you can see all of the books that she has written. We also have more upcoming free virtual book, book club events. Uh, we are uh, hearing from Eternity Martis in uh, May. Um, Danielle Hankel will Join us for a French session in June, Christine Dagana in July, Cynthia Loist in September, and Amanda Hamilton in November. Upcoming virtual events. So we have our Monday Mojo that we run every Monday. We have one more session of the April sessions uh, this Monday coming up. Uh, May will feature Claudette and NKG, and June will be Leanne and Sancheri. We also introduced last week our Raw Stand and Raw Courage event series. Uh, this is a new series that we're doing and it's going to carry over throughout the year. Uh, we look forward to having you join us and um, just learn about some uh, different women and their raw stories and um, how you can uh, stand up in raw courage as well. And yesterday we introduced that we are doing our first annual Canadian Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Summit on May 26th and 27th. We're very excited about this. We've been working for the last six months on our annual report card and we will be releasing the information and findings from that. A lot of uh, actually what Leslie Ann talked about today came out in our report and we'll be reporting out on that at our CD Summit on May 26th and 27th and we'd love for you to join us. Uh, membership, we're always looking for new members in our community. Right now we are offering a WXM membership for a special price of $99 for an annual membership and it um, gains you access to many of our programs at a discounted price or for free as well as a member portal where you can interact with other WXM members. And our top 100 nominations are open. Uh, Leslie Ann is a top 100 winner and as well I saw a few others on the call today who are top 100 winners. Um, we're always looking for you to nominate a powerful woman or nominate yourself to nominate someone. It is free and our nominations are open until the end of June so please do take the time to nominate a powerful woman. Thank you so much to our corporate sponsors. Without their support we would not be able to do free events like this. So um, thank you to them and thank you um, for their support for um, everything that they do in our organization. And again, thank you so much to Leslie Ann uh, for joining us today. We had such a great time and you shared so much um, valuable information and please everyone do visit Leslie Ann's website to check out um, what she has available for courses for a money coach. Thank you, everyone.